I've been running around the country there, and uh, whenever I get a chance to be in the church, I'm telling you, get out of here and go do something. Whenever I'm out there, I say, get in there. <laughs> so that's, that's my ministry and my part of it. Um, you know, I was looking at your bulletin here, and it says, declare the unseen in 2017. Now, I like that because one of my favorite scriptures is Hebrews 11.1 1, where it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I, God gave me a little different twist on that, and he said, I am the unseen God, but you are my seen representative. So each one of us, whether you realize it or not, is the visible representation of the invisible God. See? We, the only way that people on earth know that God exists is by our testimony of what he's done in our life and that he is risen and we will be risen and that we are his a testimony to the fact that he lives. Did you know you're a better testimony than all the crusades and all the TV and everything that's going on? The individual testimony of what God did for you is undeniable. Nobody can refute that. They can argue scriptures with you, but they can't refute what happened to you. Once I was blind and now I see, you know. Ask the blind man. He saw it all. Uh, but I want to uh, also in, in going with that theme because I, I'm wearing a little cross right here. Now, you can't see the detail on this, but in fact, I had it on my uh, phone there. There's a thing called a laminin, which is an unseen element, but it's one of the elements that holds all biological creatures together. And if you look that up, Laminin, L-A-M-I-N-I-N, you'll see that it's in the shape of a cross. And that element in the shape of a cross with some little other things on it is um, the thing, one of the elements, the main elements that holds all things together and goes along with the scripture by God through all things consist and all things are held together. So... Paul, I talked to him about this, and he made this cross for me. This is unique. It's the only one that we know that exists. And uh, you might talk him into making one for you, though. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and it gives you a point of testimony to tell people. I can talk to people about, hey, you know what this is? This is a laminin. You know, what the heck's a laminin? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> So you can go on and, and but anyway, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and uh, I feel that this is one of my homes. I lived with Paul and Noreen for three years, and uh, I feel that their home is part of my home, and I'm, I live in Oakland now with uh, SOS San Francisco, and we're just constantly doing outreaches, plus I travel around the country. But... I'm just blessed to be here, and Sonny, listen here. Listen, you're going to get blessed today. You're going to get triple blessing. God bless. Thanks. All right. So I, I think I'll use, maybe I'll use this one here. Um, I guess I can use this one here. All right. Uh, is this one coming out? It is. All right. All right. Uh, the words to this song uh, I'm going to sing right now is um, it, pretty intense because you have to realize, you know, when I sing this song, I see it the way I wrote it, and when I wrote it, I wrote it on the streets, okay? So a lot of these uh, words are actual what we were experienced, like when it says, I won't bow down to your parade of sin. Let the city roar, let the city win. The march of fools beat to that drum. My heart is beating to the sound from above. 
I won't bow down if they stamp out my song. Banners of love fly forever long. I won't bow down flows the crimson tide, the sting of death from the devil's lies. I won't bow down to you face to face. You bring all your cuts, you can bring all your pain. Crucify me at the gates of hell. Resurrection life is my victory yell. The arena clears. You think I'm dead and gone. A burst from Gabriel's trumpet is drawn. God's fury comes in the clouds of song. A two-edged sword divides the right from the wrong. Won't bow down to the dragon's flame Smoking mirror of this evil lane I'll turn away from your wicked dance The Broadway lights and your false romance I won't bow down I won't bow down I won't bow down I only bow to the King of Kings He's the one that makes my heart sing I won't bow down to your parade of sin Let the city roar, let the city win The march of fools be to that drum My heart is beating to the sound of I won't bow down I won't bow down I won't bow down I only bow to the king of kings He's the one that makes song banners of love fly forever long I won't bow down flows a crimson tide the sting of death from the devil's line I won't bow down I won't bow down I won't bow down bow down to you face to face bring all your cuts you can bring all your pain crucify me at the gates of hell resurrection life is my victoria I won't bow down trumpet is drawn God's fury comes in the clouds of song two-edged sword divides the right from the wrong I won't bow down I won't bow down 
can take this, babe. Fantastic. Went, um, it just um, felt the Lord leading me today to not talk a lot because God is in our midst and he give, he's given us a few that have come. My brother, Sonny Laura, and um, I'm going to preach a little bit after and then we're going to we're going to do what God asks us to do. And I believe what God is going to do here today is, uh, is uh, powerful. He's going to reveal himself to us in, a, in a, a glorious way today. And I'm excited about it. So I'm, I'm letting you in on the secrets out. Jesus is here, and he's going to do something amazing in our midst this morning. And... I, I've heard about Sonny. I heard about Sonny when we were doing evangelism out in the streets in San Jose. I heard about Sonny for years and years, but I'd never met him. And we had a businessmen's fellowship gathering with the men, and uh, he was our main speaker. And so I saw him there, and I walked over, and I said, you're Sonny Laura. He said, yeah. He said, and I said, I'm Paul Coca. And he goes, what's your last name? And I said, Coca. And he said, you have a brother named Mark? And I said, yeah. And he said, we were bunk mates in San Quentin. So he's got an amazing testimony. And I tell you, that joined me right at the hip with this brother. I love this brother dearly, man. I give my life for him, truly. And I'm thankful for Sonny Lara. Come on, brother. Come and share a little bit with us. Amen. That's right. That's right. First of all, I want to give God all the glory, all the honor. And, you know, I'm sure like every one of us, the only reason why we're breathing is because of God. But, you know, how many knows that God didn't save us just to save us? If that was the point, the moment we got saved, God would kill us because he wouldn't need us. When I mean, God saves us because he empowers us and he trains us to become his light. We become the voice of God. We become the hands of God. We become the feet of God. And that's why the Bible says to go to the highways and byways and to compel my people to come in. I was never to get out of prison. I was in prison. I've been out 31 years. 31 years. Married to the same woman 43 years. All my children are saved. Every one of them. My three son-in-laws, my daughter-in-law, all my grandbabies are all saved. Because God told me that if I served him in prison, I had an encounter. Now, how many knows we read about encounters? Uh, you know, Paul had an encounter. Saul was his name at the time. And, you know, violent, wanted to destroy the church of God. At that time, it was called the way. And he had paperwork from the governor to destroy anyone that believed in the way. And so on his way to Damascus, he had a God encounter where the Bible says that the Holy Spirit knocked him to the ground. Now, when people say God's a gentleman. I don't know. Ask Paul that. You know, he was slammed to the ground. And not only that, he woke up blind. You know, he was blind, you know, like a concussion or something. You know, he was blind. But, and you know what's crazy? Because Jesus already had died. And he was saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and Saul knew who it was. 
Because he said, Lord, Lord, is that you? He knew. But the other men around him couldn't see. You are specially designed and appointed and anointed by God. In John 15, 16, it said, you did not choose me, but I chose you to go bear fruit and much fruit and fruit that shall remain. And I'm like, I don't know no good people. I've been a drug dealer since I was 12 years old. I was in juvenile hall at 12 years old. I was on probation. I never got off probation. I got off parole. All my life, uh, ran by that. I got a bullet in me on the side of my face. I got shot when I was 18 years old. I've had over two, uh, 10 overdoses. And one of them, I was said that I was dead for two hours. And when I came out of the overdose, scared the doctors and literally scared me. I knew where I was at, but I didn't know where I was at. I knew I was at a hospital. I hated the, the, those big old white lights because whenever I woke up, I was handcuffed to the bed. And, and those lights were there while they were trying to bring me back. And then I would hear, they would say, well, where did you get it? I always said, I found it. All right, he's not talking. Let's get out of here. And the cops would leave. And this time, there was no cops around me. I was like, man, what happened? So when I came out, they said, later, we're going to call the cops. I said, call them. I'm leaving. I pulled the needles out of my arms. The two, I already knew the routine. They put needles to, give you, to bring you back, tubes to revive you. And uh, I was like, where am I at? And I'm trying to get out of here. And I looked, and there was my wife in the waiting room. And she looked like she had sound, seen a ghost. And she said, uh, they said you weren't going to make it. I said, how long have we been here? She said, over two hours. I said, let's leave. They're going to call the cops. And I left. And uh, they never came looking. You know, the cops never went to my house. But I was the kind of guy, if you want me, you got to come and get me. I've been in three high police chases. Uh, I had, in San Jose alone, I had 19 arrests, two sawed-off shotgun cases, two assault with deadly weapons on police. Uh, I dealt business with businessmen. I had no respect for none of these people because you've seen men in ties and suits, and they still bought drugs off of us. You know, poor people don't have 2000 or $20,000 to buy a pound of Coke. It's wealthy people that do. They just distribute it on the other side of town, and the police know that. They know that the wealthy people buy the drugs and take them to the people down there and because they'll take the chance of getting busted for them. You know, it happened. Well, anyway, then there's the Bible talks about the generational curse in Exodus chapter 20, 1 through 5, that, I w that the generation curse will be passed to the third and fourth generation in Exodus 25. And my grandfather was in the syndicate. And my, I was always told that I was like my grandfather, and you're going to die like your grandfather in the streets. And I said, yeah, I am. So, you know, I was dumb. I didn't know. The Bible says that in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. And, you know, and I tell people, don't ever beat your children down. Don't ever tell them they're never going to make it. They're never going to amount to anything. Don't prophesy destruction over your family. You need to start ministering and telling, I don't know what you're going to be, but you're going to be something great. You're going to be powerful because God gave you life, not the devil. The devil can't give life. He only takes life. The Bible says in John 10, 10, that Satan comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But God says, I come to give you life and give it abundantly. In John 15, 16, he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you to go bear fruit and much fruit and fruit that shall remain. So I said, all right, God, I started a Bible study in San Quentin where I met Paul's brother and the guards would tell me, we like when you do Bible study because it calms the inmates down. And I didn't know the power of God, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4.20, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, Paul says, I do not come with elegant words, but I come in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. So men's faith will not rest in men, but on God's power. God can change anybody. He is looking for people to stand in the gap. I love what you says, the house of prayer, because the house of prayer becomes a house of power. People who pray a little, hear a little. People who pray a lot, hear a lot. Now, when I got out, I just started ministering to people. Next thing you know, I was on the 700 Club. I was on Jay Leno. I was on the Maury Povich, and I'm like, how in the heck did I get here? You know, I don't even know these people, but they were hearing what I was doing. And all I did was I didn't want another young man or a young lady to go down the road I went. 
That's what I didn't want, but I didn't know it was the call of God. I didn't know that God was calling me. Now I work with senators. I work with mayors. I work with five chiefs of police. In fact, we're going to have a men's fellowship this Saturday at the drying shed. And the senator texts me twice, Senator Jim Bell. He says, I will be there. And he's a man of God. Senator Jim Bell is a man of God. He will be there. Angel Rios, over all parks and recs in San Jose, he will be there. Dr. Cliff Daughtery, the president of Valley Christian School, he will be there. Now, these are the friends that I have now, and they tell me that God sent me to them, and I'm saying, God sent you to me. We argue about it. I'm like, you know, and I'm there with all these, like, all these millionaires. I have a young man that I got out of the gangs. I have a contract with the city. I have 10 people that work with me. Four of them are ex-gang members. And the other one is my son and my daughter that work for me in the schools. We have an agency called Firehouse. And I tell, and if you don't have a fire, I'll put one in you. If your fire is wild, we'll help you adjust it. Well, anyway, I didn't know that I needed $30,000. And I tell people, God brings provision for the vision. Now, Pastor Dick Bernal out of Jubilee, that's my pastor. I've been with them for 31 years. And he always told me, don't cut your hair, don't change the way. God gave you that get up so you can get into them dark places. I do ride a Harley. I have a bike. I've ministered to Hell's Angels. I've ministered to Mongos. I've, I've, I led two presidents from the motorcycle club to Jesus. One just sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, you don't never know who you're going to minister to. You don't need to be a tough person to go talk to those people. You have to be a person that's on fire for God. Just like this brother that goes to New Orleans, wherever he goes, this man of God that takes the cross. I take my hat off to people like that. Uh, Paul and Noreen, or how far they drive all the way to be here with you. And, and he reminds me so much of his brother. I swear I thought it was seeing his brother. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's what, and, and we got close together because of that. And his brother, we'd be in, like I said, in Quinton. And they would give me the microphone and I would say Bible study in the chow how, in the chow hall. And I would go in there. I was in, I was in Folsom. I was in CRC. I was in Chino. I was in Susanville. I was in all these different prisons. And I would hear God's voice saying, is this how you want to live in a controlled environment? when to get up, when to go to bed, when you can eat. When the voice of God came into my cell, he said, I visit the woman at the well, but I visit you in the cell. You could come serve me or make this place your home. And and the good thing, I was in the cell by myself. Though it was like the book of Ezekiel. The Bible says when the spirit of God came on Ezekiel, he fell like a dead man before God. That's exactly what happened to me. I felt his presence. It, was a, it wasn't a scary presence. It was a beautiful peace, a presence that came on me that I never felt before. And I remember getting on my knees in prison and telling God, I want to change, but I don't know how to change. I go, if you can change me, here you are. But I told God, if you don't change me, they won't bring me back alive. I ain't doing this no more. I've been in there since I was 12 years old. I've been taken out of my bed and, and drugged to school. I've been taken into jail because I fit the description of someone else. And, you know, that's like the devil. He comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. And God says, I come to give you life. And I said, God, what could I do for you? He said, you're going to let them know that there's a way out of that destructive lifestyle. Remember when he told Paul in Acts chapter 9 and 10, he told Paul, you'll, be, you'll go before kings and authorities and you will let them. He said, Paul, you will suffer for my name's sake. And some of us, we suffer a different way. God strengthens us. I mean, I'm in meetings uh, you know, I work with the ambassador from United Nations who travels the world. He gave me an honorary doctor's degree. He goes, I don't know anyone that could do what you do. And how many knows? Because God, you're unique when God makes you. You're a unique individual. You have an anointing. The Bible says in 1 John 2.20, but you all have an anointing who knows the truth. Now, I couldn't read the Bible. I used to throw it down and say, God, I can't do this. No one told me not to start in the, New Te- in the Old Testament. I opened the book to Daniel, and I said, all right, maybe this is where God wants me to read. And I ran into, I could say it now, Nebuchadnezzar. 
uh, his friends, Meshach, Shidrach, and Abednego. I said, God, this guy got 14 letters in his name. I can't do it. I threw it down. I counted how many letters was in his name. And I said, man, God, I can't. And then his friends' names were Meshach, Shidrach, and Abednego. I said, God, I can't do this. I'm, I quit. And God wouldn't leave me alone. He said, go to chapel. I said, Lord, just leave me alone. And he said, no, go to chapel. I said, all right. You know, you calm down. You know, you get excited. Then you calm down. You know he's always right. I said, all right, I'm going to go to chapel. And I went. And what was the man preaching on? Meshach, Shidrach, and Abednego, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. And I sat there going, oh, my God, he sent him in here for me. He sent this man in here because that's what God does. He's, not, he's always an encourager. He says, I'm a restorer. I restore you. In Romans 12, 2, he says, be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he started to lead me in verses in 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing that abides in you, you don't need any man teach you. The anointing will teach you all things. If you remain in him and he remains in you, it will prove to be real and not counterfeit. John 14, 26, everything that the Holy Spirit, a comforter, has taught you will remind you what it has taught you. So I banked on those things. And then Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. I said, God, I'm in this cell by myself. I'm going to read out loud to myself, and I believe you're going to give me faith. How many of those God's looking for crazy people like that? Like Abraham, God, if there be 50, would you save them? God, if there be 40, God, don't, don't be afraid to challenge God. Isaiah 46, 23, he says, state your case. Tell me why I should do this. God is looking for men and women that will challenge God. Now, I have no business in the political field, but they bring me in all the time. The senator says, I want you to go to two prisons with me. And this was just a year ago. And I hope that the senator talks about it on Saturday a little bit because first they blocked me. He calls me a day before an hour. He goes, they just blocked you to going into the prison. He goes, I'm going to make some phone calls. He goes, but I just wanted to let you know what's going on. I said, all right, senator. So I started just praying. He calls me back at five. He says, done. They cleared you. So I go to the prison. And when we're there, there's these, all these guards there. Because they want to know who's this man that the senator got a hold of the governor and all to get him in there. So they're looking at me like, you know, all crazy. That's him. He looks like he belongs in here. <laughs> so anyway, we go in there and I'm watching all these guards. They have to go through. And that's why I didn't want to go to the prison. I was done. Get up against the wall, pat you down and do that. I was sick of that. I didn't want any more of that. And I said, God, I'll only go because I love you. And then the senator goes, I want you to be my eyes and ears. He goes, we've had 21 suicides within one year here. And we need to know what's going on in this prison. And, when the, and there was newspaper, cameras, everyone, the mayor was there, the chief was there, everyone you can think was there. And then the senator goes, these are my two friends. This is Pastor Sani and Evangelist Teddy Herrera with me. He, he goes, all right. We gave you guys $700 million. Now what do you guys want? Because they called the meeting. And it was a budget cut. They cut the budget for the meds to the inmates in there. And they had them so strung out on those meds that they were killing themselves. Because they were so addicted. You ever seen a dope fiend? You ever seen someone addicted? So but they'll do anything for that drug. And that's what it was. And the senator goes, look, Rev, in Matthews 25, 39 and 40, it says, and they went to the prison. And Jesus said, as you've done unto them, you've done unto me. This is the senator preaching to me. And I'm like, wow, this guy's a trip, man. We're in here. Then I'm in there. I'm in the warden. They're taking me in the warden's cart around the prison. And the warden's walking. Somebody goes, how did you guys get my cart? I said, we carjacked you. <laughs> You know, and we're in there, and then, and then there's, a, there's inmates on this side, inmates on this side. There's a middle row, and then there's people from Washington, D.C. There's people from the Capitol because it's like an investigation. So when we go in there, the inmates look at us, and we start ministering to the inmates. One, me on this side and the other guy on the other side. And the warden goes, we need more men like this guy. And the senator goes, that's why I hang out with this guy. He does that in the streets too. You know, because we know that we're the only Jesus they're going to see. 
You're the only Jesus. When I was in prison, God told me to go talk to this guy. And this guy was some big dude with about 21 inch arms. I said, God, I don't even know him. And he says, go. And I said, I ain't going. I don't know him. God wouldn't leave me alone. I said, all right. So God has a way with us. I went and I talked. And this big old guy that looked like he could, like the Hulk, broke down crying, said he'd been waiting for God for that word. And I said, man, God, I'll never do that again. People are waiting for you to tell them what God told you to tell them. It's not a coincidence that you feel that. That's God saying, give them that word. They've been waiting for it. The Bible calls us messengers. The Bible says that where to go and to let them know about it. So, you know, I just kept looking. Yeah, my life was threatened in there because of where I came from. But right away, the Holy Spirit led me to Mark 16, 7. Those who reverence God, even your enemies will be at peace. I had to know. I said, God, you're either God or I'm a dead man. I, I don't want to use a way. I don't, I don't want to. I'm, I'm done. I can't live this way anymore. And God started renewing me. Then a prison guard gave me a book by Kenneth Hagin's called Man's Possibilities and Man's Impossibilities and God's Possibilities. And I looked at this guard. I go, man, he must not have read my records. This guy's treating me like a person. You know, not like a convict or an inmate. I was like, wow. And then one of the first songs we learned was Jesus on the main line. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean... I don't know if you guys prayed that or had it planned, but God was talking to me. It was one of the first songs, Jesus on the Main Line. And they say, call them up and tell them what you want. We say, if you want the Holy Ghost, then tell them what you want. If you want forgiveness, then tell them what you want. But it was Jesus on the Main Line. And all this stuff is new to me. You know, I'm like, and first of all, I said, hey, I'm a Catholic. I'm going to die Catholic. And the church in there is called Protestant. And these two guys said, just go one time. Just check it out one time. So I said, all right, I'll go. And I've never looked back ever since. That one time is all it took. That's why our job is to get them to the house of God, and God will do the rest. You know, we're, we're doing a tent revival in Modesto. This tent holds 1,000 people. And uh, I'll be speaking. I was, we were with a band yesterday called Malo and Bueno. Their, their biggest hit was Suavecito. They were playing. They're going to play before I come on. I've asked four ex-gang members to lead me up the stage. Four guys that in the streets, they would kill each other. And these guys are going to bring me up that I led them all to Jesus. Because I want people to see that, uh, what, what God can do. You know, the Bible says they know you by the blood of it and your testimony. And I, got, I, I didn't know what to do. God would tell me, go to this meeting. I said, God, I don't even know how to talk like those people. And he said, go. He says, I'll give you a word. It's in Isaiah 50, verse 4. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructive tongue to sustain the weary. He awakens me morning by morning like one being taught. God said, if you go, I'll give you a word. And he gives me a word for those powerful people. He'll come and they'll look. And he said, could I talk to you? And then God lets me release the word to them. And I mean, that's what God God does. Amen. God will give you a word and just go and speak that word. You know, God loves you. The Bible says that we could all prophesy and prophesy does three things, edifies, encourage and builds up. How many need to hear that God loves you? You know, and it's not an accident. Me and you are talking because, because I serve the Lord and, and he doesn't make mistakes. And the next thing they open up. Amen. But I'm honored to be here. And like I said, you know, God opened Luke 24, 45. He says, now I open your understanding that you understand the scriptures. And, and that's what God does. He'll give me a word. Okay. So then the Bible says about laying hands when you're done in Mark 16, 20. He says, wherever you preach and teach my word, I will come up with signs and wonders. So I said, I guess I must be the elder. I'm having the Bible study. I bring oil, anoint them with oil. And next thing they're on the floor. And I go, wow, what happened? And, and they just started happening. And no one's catching them. They're getting slain in the spirit. And I'm like, wow, my wife goes, that's being slain. I just got out of prison. I go, man, God, I'm still on parole, man. If someone gets hurt, they're going to send me back. <laughs> I kid you not. So let me tell you what I did because it didn't matter who I laid hands on. Bam, he would lay them out. To this day, it's the same way. So I go, I got an idea. We had a king-size mattress <laughs> in the garage. We're going to pray. And they would bring the mattress out. Yeah. 
I ain't going back to prison. And, and, I would, and the ushers looked funny. Some of them were there with us yesterday. They would sit there and try to catch these people, and the power would lay them out. And I said, man, I ain't going back this way. Because I knew, but I didn't know every time we laid hands. Because God put an anointing on every one of us. In Mark 16, 17, those who believe shall lay hands on the sick, shall cast out devils in my name, shall speak in heavenly languages. Well, now God uses me with handkerchiefs. Acts 19, 11 through 12. He said God did extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. Through handkerchiefs and apron. I give them out to this day. Five people that should be dead will be at that tent giving testimony. One guy had eight tumors, and all they could do said, you know, all we could do is make you comfortable. There's nothing else we could do. And that's my brother-in-law, and I gave him a handkerchief, and God healed him. He went, when he went back to the doctor, he goes, I don't, we, we don't know what happened here, but somebody up there loves you. Now, there's a woman that will be there. They were going to remove her, her breast and her female organs. I was preaching to about 250 young adults. And she came up and she said, God said you're to give me a handkerchief. And, uh, and she was one of the, the ushers for that there. And I said, and when she said that, the Holy Spirit said, yeah. I said, hang on, stand right here. Just start giving God thanks. And I, I always write the verses that God gives me on the handkerchief. She goes back. To the, host, to the doctor, the doctor tests her one more time. He says, bring your family. We need to have an emergency meeting. He goes, I don't know what happened, but the surgeries are canceled. You're 100% free of cancer. Amen. Her friend had cancer in the liver and the face, healed. A five-year-old little boy had leukemia with the same handkerchief. Four people were healed. And I, they called me, they live in my, and I asked them all to come on the night of the tent and to bring those handkerchiefs because we're already laying hands over 300 handkerchiefs and whoever takes them. So Valley Christian, everybody know where Valley Christian School is? They're all mostly business people. So I said, God, you can change their faith. I brought a handkerchief. I have a picture. They're all laying hands on the handkerchief. Because of a young man they know in San Diego that was hit by a car and left for dead. They fixed his ribs, but he said if he lives, he'll probably be brain damaged. So they went, and he said, I want you to pray for a handkerchief. I said, why don't we all lay hands? So I got a picture of him. They took it to him. They, put a, they asked me to pray in the phone. They put the phone to his ear, and he came out of the coma. And he said, who's Pastor Sonny? And he's still up there. And then they tested him. Uh, he's putting sentences together. He's, they're showing him pictures. And this is all just recently probably in the last couple of months. He's the healer, not us. He's the deliverer, not us. He's the savior, not us. He's just looking for someone to take it to him. Amen? Every one of you have the power of God in your life. It doesn't matter who you touch. When you touch him, I say, all right, God, now it's time to do your part. Now, how many knows that the word of God never returns void? So when I was in prison, I would put scriptures on shirts. I took an art class. And, and I put scriptures, and they say, what's it say? I said, read it. And when they would read it, I said, all right, God, I did my part. Now you do yours. Because the Bible says in Isaiah 55, 11, when my word goes forth, it never returns void. Jeremiah 1, 12, he hastens to perform his word. Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is sharp and powerful than the double had said. Sword. So I wouldn't read it. I would tell him, read it. And I said, all right, God, <laughs> you got to do your part. Because that's what he says. And God is looking for people like that. I said, God, I'm done preaching. I don't know what you're going to do when I'm done. But you said in Mark 16, 20, that when we're done preaching and teaching, that you will accompany it with signs and wonders. Bam, he breaks out with miracles. Tumors, cataracts, deaf ears. We just had a woman uh, about two months ago in a little Bible study, about 10 people. No one knew she had two earphones. My niece prays for her, and she says, I hear pop in both of my ears. And she pulled them out. We were all like, whoa. Because, you know, God just uses anybody that believes. When you go and lay your hands, you put God to operate through you. Every one of you. But thank you for allowing me to speak to you. I'm going to be here with my brothers and with the pastor. And, and I, I'm honored to be here before you. I live right off of Cochrane, right up the street from here. But, you know, just tell you, keep us in prayer because we believe in miracles. We believe in deliverances. We believe in healing. And please never tell anyone that they're no good or look at what you're doing. Tell them, you know what? Because the Bible says where there's much sin, grace abounds. 
Romans 5.20. And Timothy, Paul calls himself a chief sinner. 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, I'm a chief sinner. Paul calls himself that, bragging. I was the chief sinner. So now he's the chief apostle. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So today we're really here about the idea. You know, I preached a lot of sermons here. Some of my best sermons God gave me, and I preached a lot of sermons here. And the Lord said, I don't want you to preach a sermon today. And I said, okay, well, what do you want? And I believe that the Lord wants to reveal himself in, in a, an amazing way. And first, first of all, I'm hoping, like Simeon prayed and the, and the Lord said he was going to see it with his very eyes, he would see the promise of the Messiah. And he waited about the temple day and night. He waited on the Lord because he knew the promise was coming. He turned 30, right? promise never came. Turned 40, turned 50, turned 60, turned 70. Promise never came. What was he doing? Waiting around the temple because he knew what he heard with his ear and what he believed in his heart that the promise was coming, you see. And so as he waited on the Lord for the promise, here he turns 80, right? And, and he, he wonders, I imagine, can you imagine people saying, you know, the promise is never going to come. Oh man, you're just you're just uh, living a fool's life, you know. You're just you're just living a fool's life because the promise is not going to come. And yet, Simeon believed in his heart. I'm going to see with my eyes the promise of the child of the Messiah. I'm going to see. And sure enough, he waited. Come about 90, I don't know, maybe he was 90, I don't know, some, some Bible scholars here might tell you exactly what how old he was, here comes the promise. <laughs> here comes the promise. Here comes the promise of, of the Messiah. Here comes your promise, okay? Some of you have waited. Some of you have interceded. You've taken the time, and the Lord has said, wait and watch and pray because the promise is on its way. And I'm about ready to tell you that something supernatural is going to take place today and it's in the it's in the shape of two things it's in the shape of a pillar it's in the shape of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night okay and so we are following Jesus we are the ones that God said come follow me and I will make you fishers of men come follow me and these are the signs the Lord are going to lay before us and open up the heavens to declare it, decree it, and make it known among this city and the cities that we go to. A pillar by day, a cloud by day, a, and a, a pillar of fire by night. So the Lord spoke to me this morning, and he said, why, I said, why aren't there pillars? What, does this church have a pillar? Does this church have a couple of pillars? Are there pillars? And then the Lord spoke to me also, and he said, he said, there are pillars. There are pillars, and some of you are those pillars. You're the ones that have stood there and waited for the promise. You are the ones that have said, Lord, I'll shoulder this. I'll carry this. I'll do this work. I'll commit myself to this. I'll be the one, Lord. I'll stand for you, God, in the, in the interim. I'll stand for you. I will stand for you, Lord. And because you have stood, the Lord is saying, I'm going to crown you. <laughs> I'm going to crown you. I see the Lord adorned, high and lifted up, and his glory filling the temple. Boy, Shemaya Sipo Hokushibate. 
Uramate city yashumare bo sete ni burubu ko sete ni burubu. What we want to do is pray for the pillars today. We want to pray for you. You're desiring to shoulder some work here in this house, this house on Depot Street, and the Lord wants to reveal that cloud by day, that pillar by day, and that pillar of fire by night. I inquired of the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't know exactly what that means. Because I've never really, I've heard people say that they've seen pillars over my pillars of fire over my house, and I've heard people say that they've seen some supernatural things about the ministry work that we've done. Sometimes I've even imagined things in my mind because I believe it. I believe it, and I, I desire it, and I want it. I want the presence of the Lord, and you have desired that. And so I'm going to ask my brother Sonny, Noreen, others to come. We're going to stand here, and we're going to pray for first for the leadership here in the church. We're going to ask that the Lord would anoint you and strengthen you as a pillar in this house. You see, the enemy has come as a wind, uh, and not a mighty rushing wind. The devil comes as a wind of destruction. I remember when I was out in Colorado, 1977, my first evangelistic trip with Bob Birdsong. And we got out of the prison that day because we went in there to preach the gospel and to give them hope of the Lord. And many of them got saved that day. And when we left, we're in the pastor's brand new car, brand new. And he was real happy about his telling us about his brand new car on the way in. He parked his brand new car. He brushed it off a little bit. We got out and we got in there and we start preaching the gospel, right? And praying for people. And God was delivering them and setting them free. You know, isn't it I iconic and ironic that the Lord would go into the prisons and set the people free there? You know why he sets them free, real freedom? in prisons is because they know what it is to be in bondage. They know what it is to be set in an isolation tank and to be set aside, be considered a dog or an animal. They know what it's like. And when freedom comes to them, boy, they understand it. Yeah. Right? We got out of that prison and got in our car and we started riding out and all of a sudden we look off to the left and there's a whirlwind. It's coming at us. What's that whirlwind? Where's that whirlwind going? And all of a sudden, what? The car pulls the car off to the side. The pastor gets out. Oh my goodness, look at my car. It was pelted from, top, from front to back with raw with with just dings all over it it was like what the heck and he was like he, got, he says man the devil must really be mad at us man yeah, yeah. So, so the fact is that some of us have been pelted by the attack of the enemy a little girl gets up in our chalice she's telling us about the enemy's attack against her life her suicide her suicidal um uh, tendencies she was i don't know maybe 14? Yeah, and she was saying this happened when she was 12 and 13. For a whole year, the devil would attack her, right? And, and the devil would come and try to strangle her. She would feel the enemy, actual, uh, some spiritual force over her, grab her, and start, start choking her out, you know? And, and someone else said, no, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if I could really believe all that, right? One of the grandmas or something was in her room. He said he saw, she saw the bed actual moving, okay? And so these were attacks of the devil, right? And she explained to us how the Lord came and set her free, right? And then Scott got up and gave a, a, a very authoritative word. He said, you don't ever entertain anything to do with the devil, the one thing we do with the devil is rebuke him, resist him, put him in his place. He's behind us in the name of Jesus. We give him no entertainment at all. He doesn't deserve it. Who was it? Uh, it was, um, Smith Wigglesworth. You know, he had one night he was there and, and he said he, he 
felt something, woke up in the middle of the night, looked over, and there was the devil sitting there. What did Smith Wigglesworth do? One of the great evangelists. Exactly. He said, ah, oh, it's just you. Turned over and fell back asleep. Don't give him any attention. Our attention is on the Lord Jesus. And he's the one that leads and gives us triumph and gives us victory and gives us overcoming strength. Okay? The Lord spoke to me here when worship was happening, when Sonny was preaching. He said, there are some walls. There are some walls that need to be torn down. And we are wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places today. We are coming against those things. There's some walls. That's why we've seen some things not happen. That's why we've seen some things not going on because there's been some walls the enemy has set. So I said, Lord, how do we get against, how do we come against those walls? And I felt the Lord say to me, he says, you overcome. That's how you do it. You don't try to break the wall down. You just go over it. You see? You got the power and the strength to go over it. You see? And the word of the Lord says that, you hearing this? The word of the Lord says, Behold, I'll do a new thing. Shall you not know it? Shall not spring forth? I'll even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Okay? Now, a way in the wilderness means that you're pioneers. You're not settling for someone else's path. You're not going down someone else's road. God has given you a machete of the word of God, and you're like someone going through the jungle. You're going out there, and you're ripping through that stuff, and you're going to come out, and you're going to lead people, and people are going to follow in your footsteps because you're pioneers. That's what this church is, a pioneering church, a work of the Lord. That's why you have suffered so much, Mike, because you have pioneered a work. And God, he loves his pioneers, but the devil hates those pioneers. Away in the wilderness, in the wilderness, okay? And then rivers in the desert, okay? Okay, rivers, the desert. Think about the sand, okay? Was it always sand? No. It was big, huge rocks and mountains. And then the rivers came. And that's what we're in. We're in the river of God. And, the, and as the river of God is poured out upon us and it through our lives, that, those big mountains and those big boulders and those big rocks get broken down, you see? And right now you see them as big rocks. How are we ever going to get around this? see it as a mountain. How are we ever going to get over this? You see it as something like you can't even believe. Well, I'm telling you for a fact, I've seen it in my own life. I know what it's like to look ahead and say, what has happened? It's all sand now, and there's rivers in the desert, you see. In the desert, there are rivers, okay? That's the word of the Lord, okay? And so we're going to pray, and that's the end of my little preach. Thank you. Yeah. So we want, we want to pray. We want to pray today. And uh, I first wanted to ask if I could get Sonny and I, if I can get... Scott, you're a man of God. You, God has so much authority in this man. He doesn't even know it. And I appreciate Scott so greatly. Uh, us three guys are going to come and we're just going to pray for the leadership first and then we want to open it up from there. And so first, the leadership, if you guys could come forward and whoever, Pastor Mike and Roxanne, Pastor Roxanne, and others that you want for the leadership to come forward, okay?
all those fears are dropping off. No more worried about things. And do I do this or don't I do this? You are called of God. Oh, shemata lebo, shemata lezete lebo robo kosete de 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 de. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I hear God in the name of Jesus. And according to my word in, in Jeremiah 23, 29, he says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks rocks to pieces? God said, I'm shattering everything that comes against you, my son, for it will be under your feet. According to my word in Romans 16, 20, that the devil's under your feet. He has no authority, no say-so over your body, says God. I am releasing an impartation. I am releasing my healing bomb from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, says God. It will push out any sickness, any disease, any infirmity. We command it to leave now in Jesus' name. And we pray for fresh fire. Yes, fresh fire. Fresh fire. God said, because of my revelation, I'm taking you and giving you elevation, said God. I'm elevating you to another place, says God. I, because you've been faithful in me, says God. My word says in Revelation 3.20, though we have little strength, but you kept my word. I've opened a door that no man can shut. Yeah. And God said, I'm opening new doors. You're at a new place, my son, a new place. You will see it in your dreams. You'll even have visions of it, says God. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. One mind, one accord. Awesome. And the rest of Romans 16, 20 that he spoke about says and Satan will be crushed under your feet shortly 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 this shall come to pass because Acts 14 says there is many tribulations that we go through for the expansion of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God has expanded on your account Are you keeping this for the recording? Yes, yeah, so that we can okay. get it recorded. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay, would you guys come forward so we can get to you guys? My daughter's following a prophetic and she's saying that they're seeing that there's people being healed. It was happening to me yesterday. People were breaking out weeping. And God said, I've anointed your hands. As you play, that people will be getting set free. My word says, let every instrument praise my name. And God said, you're going to see people as you start to play, start to dance. Because my word says in Psalms 149.3, they praise me with their dance. Supernatural is going to come because God said as they're dancing, they're getting healed. They're being set free. The joy of the Lord is their strength. Yes. And when you play, God said you bring joy. You bring laughter. And it sets them free. And God said they'll know in their bodies that something left them. And something new just came in them, says God. For I have anointed your hands to be a psalmist. As David played the harp and the tormenting spirit left Saul, God said, I've anointed you and I've anointed your music, my daughter. I've anointed your music that people will be set free.